Uh, thank you so much for spending some time with us, uh, whatever time it is you are. Uh, welcome to Webinar Wednesdays, the Computer Science Edition. My name is Bree Yancey. I am the Graduate Communications Coordinator for the Grad School, so I am the person to get you interested in TU and hopefully push you towards application. Um, with me here, I have Dr. John Hale, who is the Chairperson of Computer of the Computer Science Department, uh, Dr. Brett McKinney, who is Director of Masters program in the computer science program, <laughs> and uh, Dr. Papa Mauricio, um, who is the associate professor of the graduate of computer science and the grad advisor for PhD. So without further ado, I will take the, turn it over to them. Thank you so much. Well, uh, yeah, again, my, my name is John Hale. Thank you for uh, joining us today. I am, uh, as Bree said, the chairperson of the Tandy School of Computer Science uh, and uh, a professor uh, of computer science as well. I I teach in the areas of computer uh, organization and architecture, high performance computing, um, cybersecurity, and a little medical informatics from time to time. So what what I would like to do uh, before I introduce my colleagues and let them describe some of the research that they're pursuing is kind of give you a, a bit of a thumbnail sketch of uh, uh, research overall in the Tandy School of Computer Science. And so if I can, I think I will uh, share my screen and um, walk you through a, a little ad hoc slide deck that I've prepared. Hopefully that's showing up. People can people can see that. Um, you know, our, our program is uh, uh, small, but uh, I believe the things that we, the fields that we work in, we have international uh, and stellar reputations, in, and, and that includes uh, things, rep uh, areas represented by, again, the faculty here today, Dr. Papa uh, and Dr. McKinney. But a, a little bit about the program overall. Um, at the undergraduate level, we are ABED accredited, and ABED is the, the governing body that basically um, validates that you're doing all the right things educationally uh, in teaching in teaching computer science to undergraduates. And that's important for graduate students because it speaks to the quality of the program. And, you know, if you come here and if you're entering the master's program or you're entering the PhD program, you'll be working right alongside some very talented undergraduates, most likely. Um, we offer a number of degree pathways. We have a bachelor's degrees in computer science, computer simulation and gaming, and a brand new one in data science. And of course, at the graduate level, we offer a master's in computer science, a PhD in computer science, and also uh, we jointly run a program, a PhD program in computer engineering with the electrical and computer engineering department. Um, we do have state-of-the-art facilities, a nice building, a razor hall, 17,000 square feet. Computer science occupies the uh, upstairs part of that, and you know most of it is dedicated to um, research labs, uh, faculty, and graduate student offices. Uh, and there are a couple of there are a couple of teaching labs as well. So again, I, I, I sort of highlighted or mentioned we you know we have a few areas that we we think we excel in cybersecurity is is one of those and we really do um, sort of full stack research in cybersecurity. we you know investigate the full problem space which goes all the way from the silicon of the computer to the neuron of the human and so this uh, slide highlights just a few of the cybersecurity research areas that, that our computer science uh, grad students are 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 pursuing uh, and again, these can be grad students that are at the master's level or at the PhD level, but we have research efforts in autonomous system security, uh, looking at uh, things like robots, uh, drones, uh, UAVs, trying to understand um, the role of um, uh, AI and machine learning in threats and security opportunities uh, for those systems. Dr. Papa, I know has a really robust research program, uh, as well as educational opportunities 
in critical infrastructure protection. And uh, Dr. Pop, I don't know if you might want to say, I know you'll talk about it um, at length uh, here in a little bit, but is there anything you'd like to say at the outset about about that type of research? Yeah, that, that it's a, uh, for us, it's a very important area of research because um, it, most of the, uh, like sort of a critical infrastructure in any place, you know, we, we all need to have electricity and, and um, uh, water and we need the pipelines to push uh, gas and oil. And so it's a very, um, very important sector that needs to be protected. Cybersecurity for that kind of system is a little bit different than, than your regular um, uh, IT security and it requires, I think, special training and sort of knowledge about the, the, the domain and, and, and their needs. So it's a very interesting area of research. TU has been heavily involved in, in that area since 2006. And, and we continue to be, and I'll probably be talking a little later about some, some of the things we're, we're doing in that, um, in that domain. Great, thank you. And related to that, uh, we have a pretty good, a pretty serious uh, investment of research in what we call cyber physical systems security. And a cyber physical system is any system that um, has a, a kinetic or physical process that's controlled by a computer or a network which is virtually all of them these days. And so, uh, you know, our security range is from looking at Internet of Things devices to heavy trucks, uh, all the way up to uh, nuclear research reactors. Those are all cyber physical systems. They're all controlled by computers and networked. Uh, and so what's the risk posture? What are the threats and uh, sort of uh, cyber security hazards associated with those devices and and the types of work that we the type of work that we do in that space ranges all the way from the theoretical underpinnings to very applied and hands-on solutions uh one other element one other area of cybersecurity is that we're kind of unique is, is uh that we stand out in is security economics and so i don't know for the past two or three decades cybersecurity research most of it has really been about, I'm going to build this really cool security technology, and I know mechanically it'll work, it'll do the job, but we don't really understand why we develop these things or when it's appropriate to actually field them. And the brand new area of security economics really uh, tries to create a discipline that helps us answer those questions. What What's the cost benefit of applying a countermeasure? And so we have, you know, one of the world's leading experts in security economics, Dr. Tyler Moore, um, working in that space. Then we're also known for artificial intelligence research, and Dr. McKinney can speak um, directly to that. We have a pretty deep bench. Uh, we have maybe 15 faculty, and I think maybe four of them can credibly say that they are true experts in the field of artificial intelligence, um, and Dr. McKinney is one of those. Um, the rest of us are sort of amateurs or applied, I think, uh, in, in the space, but uh, the areas that we we are involved in uh, really run a pretty good spectrum. Uh, Dr. Sen, for instance, is really well known internationally for his work in multi-agent systems, and there are, you know, it's a multifaceted area that that looks at task negotiation and trustworthy and explainable AI that doesn't treat AI like a black box. Dr. McKinney, I'm sure, can talk about some of the things he's done with machine learning um, in, in well, with, with he's principally a, a bioinformaticist. Brett, tell me if I'm wrong about that, but he's also done some stuff with earthquake prediction, if I have that right. Would you like to say a little bit about some of that work? I was muted. Oh, I mean, uh, off guard. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we have a yeah we have a lot of collaborations. Um, so so yeah, I do develop a lot of machine learning uh, algorithms. That's one of my big interests. But a lot of the applications are in the bioinformatics domain. So um, we get a lot of uh, state of the art um, data from from uh, things like gene expression and genome wide association study, neuroimage data. But yeah, one one of the um, other areas or other areas of basically science 
are things like earthquake detection, detection, like weather, you know, predicting whether an earthquake is a is a is about to happen or where the the location of the earthquake. And so we've been using machine learning and deep learning type of methods to to do that. And then in other scientific areas outside of um, biomedical areas. Um, we've been doing some stuff with NASA to, um, it, it's also sort of bioinformatics because we're doing biosignature detection from mass spectrometry data that will eventually go around uh, an orbiter of the the, the moon Europa um, to, to detect uh, biosignatures. So, um, so there's a lot of um, method development, so a lot of math, mathematical foundations of machine learning. Um, and uh, actual code development, but also a lot of applications. And we've been trying to do a little bit in, in cybersecurity as well. Okay, wonderful. Uh, and so uh, another area or two really is you know, that we've uh, really begun to expand upon is uh, looking at research, looking at applications of uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, and extended reality, uh, and then also some robotics research. And so we have a group that is uh, exploring the role of uh, VR in education. They've developed a nursing student training simulator that actually helps nursing students in our uh, in our nursing college to get trained up on certain processes and protocols. Uh, and then we have a, a, a VR application in development that looks at carbon capture utilization and sequestration, uh, sort of training and educating the public on what that really means. Uh, we have a we have a, a a pretty ambitious project that's looking at um, the role of digital twins um, uh, in helping manage and operate and maintain um, what the government's calling smart installations, uh, smart buildings that are equipped with a lot of sensors and robotics. And the the idea behind a digital twin is you have you have the physical thing whether it's a room or a or a piece of equipment or a pipeline or whatever it is and then you also have its virtual embodiment uh, so it has a vr representation but the twin part is they're linked so that if i do something in the virtual space it happens in the physical space simultaneously and so um, that's a pretty ambitious project that involves a lot of moving parts um, down the road uh, we're, we're looking to invest energies more heavily in um, doing research for different application domains of robotics. So we believe that um, there's substantial work to be done in developing assistive robotics for senior citizens, for people that need um, help, uh, whether they're, you know, going through physical therapy or rehab or, or you know, maybe in a geriatric situation and then also another application domain we think and because we're in oklahoma uh, energy and oil and gas i think there's a a major role for robots which are known to you know to do things that are dirty dull or dangerous uh, essentially replacing humans taking them out of harm's way um, and then we we, we have a, an effort i think that's emerging in looking at how humans can interact effectively or efficiently uh, with robots, and then also teaming um, fleets of robots uh, for coordinated behaviors. And so this is really just sort of an overview of some of the things that we have, uh, that we're working on in research. And I think, um, unless there are questions or, or anything anybody wants to talk about, it might be a good opportunity to turn it over to Dr. Papa again and let him provide a little more detail on some of the areas he's exploring. Thank you, uh, John. So uh, I'm, I'm also a, 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 a faculty here with the um, Tandy School of Computer Science, and I also have a, a joint appointment in, in cybersecurity. So mo most of my sort of research activities center around network security, uh, and more specifically, network security applied to Plus control systems, like I mentioned before, um, started in 2006. The uh, University of Tulsa has been doing research in cybersecurity, I'd say probably since the mid 90s. And then in 2006, we decided to, to we had an opportunity 
uh, to start doing research cybersecurity, but apply to critical infrastructure. So we spent about a couple of years um, kind of learning about the uh, the specific uh, needs. The uh, when it comes to cybersecurity for that type of systems, um, there are some differences uh, with the control uh, with the control system. Like in, in an IT domain, maybe, maybe you value you value confidentiality more than maybe availability. Uh, if you're talking about a pipeline or, or electric power uh, grid or, or a substation, availability um, is more important than confidentiality. So that, that sort of thing, we had to come to a point where we understood uh, what their needs are. And we, um, we want our students here to kind of hit the ground running when, when they uh, graduate. So we have an, a number of classes where they learn how to code and how to build tools. And I've been uh, building tools then for that sector. So I have worked um, with oil and gas here at the, uh, where we're located, the uh, city of uh, Tulsa. Um, there are lots of companies that provide services to, to oil and gas companies. And so we, we've had a good opportunity to, to collaborate with them. Uh, we've also done some work with the uh, electric power sector. I'm sure you've heard that um, uh, the term that we use now is smart grid. And, and they call it smart because you, you can communicate over those uh, power lines. And they're also eventually connected to the internet and they also need to be uh, protected. So we have a unique facility here at the University of, the, of Tulsa uh, where we have a lab uh, with a scaled down version of an actual electric power uh, substation um, with uh, controllers that are connected to the network and that supports a number of uh, research projects. Um, we, um, we also have other facilities um, to, to do research in that area. That includes um, some oil and gas also. The University of Tulsa has a very uh, um, top-notch uh, petroleum and engineering department, and we have a, um, a campus here that we call it North Campus, about uh, maybe two miles uh, from the main campus. Where they uh, where they run a number of uh, industrial I, I I call it industrial facilities to uh, work with oil and gas and so we collaborate with them because those facilities they also have controllers um, or little uh, computers that are connected to a network um, they're operating at very very high pressures I have projects where um, I have facilities that are operating at 1200 psi and uh, uh, you want them to be secure because that, that those are some very high pressures something goes wrong um, it, that, that could be uh, catastrophic and so we we here at the university of tulsa we're sort of a small university compared to large state universities we, you know we have about four thousand students um, and the, the good thing about being uh, sort of on the smaller side is that we all kind of know each other. We collaborate very well. We have a number of um, uh, projects that are interdisciplinary. You, you've heard Dr. Hale, Dr. McKinney talking about some of the things they do. Uh, and it involves people from different fields. And I love that. Um, I'm, I'm working on projects right now in North Campus where I have students who are petroleum engineers. And, and then I also have some students who are um, um, essentially computer science. So in that domain, um, again, the tools that we need to use are different. The, uh, the controllers they use, they're very delicate. So even if you, if you were to put um, a network traffic that doesn't follow uh, specifications, just by putting a packet on that network, uh, it, it, it sometimes that is sufficient to shut down one of those controllers. And so we have to be very, very careful, not only uh, if we're trying to defend them, but also if we're trying to build tools, and that's what we're trying to do uh, for cybersecurity, specifically uh, for that domain. So we spend quite a bit of time looking at what kind of protocols they use in that domain, the um, protocols that are used 
uh, are very, very different from the ones that you would normally find on an IT network. Um, and those are, are protocols that carry uh, uh, control information. They're useful control. So you can open valves, you can change set points. If you can imagine, very important to protect those, uh, those protocols. Sometimes those protocols um, are, are very, uh, uh, very open and the traffic is sometimes not even encrypted. And so you can imagine if, a, if an attacker or an intruder uh, were to have access to that sort of networks and they, they knew what they were doing, they could do some pretty bad things. And so we, we're in the business of trying to help defend them. So I've, I've spent um, quite a bit of time doing research on what we call situational awareness. Um, building, essentially building tools that will give you a good idea of what's there on that type of network. Because if you don't have situational awareness, there's no way you can defend. If you don't know what's there, how could you possibly uh, defend it? And so we have done that uh, for a number of different domains that include um, electric power, oil and gas. And at one point in time, we even had a project where uh, we were trying to do that sort of things with um, uh, like research nuclear reactors because um, they're all they all have control systems um, and then the next step is obviously one thing is to have good situational awareness the next one is to build tools that can actually detect when something's going wrong and IT people tend to focus sometimes too much on on just network things and not so much on the process so the field that I work in, it's very, very important that I talk to engineers specifically who know about the process. Because for me, I'm a networks person. All I'm looking for is, is packets, packets on a network. Um, but if I don't understand what those packets are doing, then we won't be able to protect them. And that's where we need the uh, to interact or collaborate with engineers. They may know, hey, if you open this valve, more than 75% uh, things are going to go bad here. Maybe pressure is going to be too high. A network person doesn't know that. Um, and so uh, building tools that will help you detect intrusions in that kind of systems requires um, very specific knowledge, not just about network security, uh, but also a specific domain that you're trying to, to protect. And so once we um, don't situational awareness, uh, we, we also have projects where we, we try to do what's called intrusion detection systems. And that is, hey, if I can monitor what's going on in my network, can I detect um, attacks or intrusions? Can I detect that someone's scanning that network? Can I detect that someone's maybe trying to change a set point um, or vary a temperature or flows or, or things like that? And so there are different ways to do that. Some of them involve what we call machine learning or AI, um, mostly because using machine learning, you can sort of learn what, uh, uh, what's normal behavior. Those are networks essentially with a controller in a loop, infinite loop. The traffic tends to be pretty regular uh, and you can um, try and identify patterns in, in machine learning. Uh, Algorithms are something that are really, really good at that. And so we, we've had a number of projects where we use supervised and unsupervised learning uh, to try and detect attacks um, on that type of networks. So we, um, and again, we, we have to be able to do that for different domains. And so the protocols that are used in one domain are different than the protocols they use in other domains. Also, time scales are very, very different. So, for instance, uh, and on, on an oil and gas sector, sometimes things can take minutes or hours to, uh, to go bad if something were to happen. And so you have more time to respond. On the electric power sector, um, electricity and signals move very, very quickly. Something goes wrong. You need to be able to respond sort of in the order of a few milliseconds. And so they're very different different domains. Um, and when it comes to intrusion detection, let's say you, if you do electric power, you have to be very, very efficient and you have to be able to do it very, very quickly. And so there, there are different challenges. So we, we've had a number of students 
trying to do intrusion detection. And then sort of the next layer to that and is, okay, if I detect the intrusion, then what do I do now? The, the, the end goal is to try and protect those systems. So we have to be able to develop measures that will protect a system or that type of system against attacks. And there's typically two ways to go about it. Uh, there's the uh, passive way and then the active way. So passive is essentially maybe trying to communicate with a firewall and saying, hey, you know, I've detected maybe malicious traffic from, from a particular network. Uh, maybe let's block traffic from that network. Active would be maybe we send a few packets to the, uh, to the attacker to try and find out maybe what kind of systems they're doing or trying to get back to them. So um, most of the, uh, the work that we've done in that area it centers around just sort of classic network security, which will be trying to communicate with a firewall and implement some filtering rules uh, to do that. So I've, I've had students and I have projects at those three levels, situational awareness. Um, there's plenty of stuff to do there. There are things to do, uh, lots of things to do in intrusion detection and also um, countermeasures. And then uh, more recently, we, we've had some collaborative uh, projects with uh, Dr. Hell mentioned Dr. Moore, who's, who's a specialist on uh, security economics. Uh, the truth is that at the end of the day, those attacks cost money and, and companies will look at that. So one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to spend maybe, I don't know, a hundred thousand dollars trying to respond to an attack that's only worth 10,000. Uh, from, from an economic point of view, you might be better off just ignoring that attack. And so uh, there are some very interesting uh, collaborative uh, research projects that, that we have where, where we try to build tools that will take into account not just the need to minimize and protect against the against attacks, but also to be able to evaluate cost. Because at the end of the day, you have to have people who respond to the attacks. And if attacks are said, that will cause some damage. And we have to be able to measure that and optimize that. and um, so that's another area of research um, sort of in my domain. I have also, we also have some efforts, Dr. Uh, Hell was mentioning um, on the IoT, what's called the uh, Internet of Things um, domain. I was trying to find, I have, uh, actually I have one here. Uh, there are lots of different devices that we use that can actually be connected to sensors uh, that also need to be protected. And I'm, I'm going to show you maybe one here. I don't know if you, uh, it's, you can see it. This little thing right here is what you would call an IoT device. Uh, I can actually, I have it connected here to our Wi-Fi network. I can measure, you know, things like temperatures and, and humidities. And sometimes you can send signals. It so happens you can you can see by the size of that thing it has a very uh, small CPU. Uh, they typically don't run a full TCP/IP stack, and so any network security tools that are going to be used to protect that type of devices needs to take that into account, and that's a challenge. It's a challenge to try and protect them, and it's also a challenge to to try and detect. And maybe devices are in your domain. I mean, you, you saw the size. They're pretty small. Uh, they operate wirelessly. And so being able to, uh, like to do, for instance, I mentioned already situational awareness, it's very, very, very challenging. And so uh, we're right now uh, trying to develop tools that would allow an IT practitioner, security uh, personnel, to be able to maybe conduct scans where you can go into a facility, like maybe the ones that Dr. Hell was mentioning, where we have maybe extended reality and, uh, and be able to detect um, sensor or IoT devices that are out there. You often want to verify that the ones that are, are there are legit. And if there's one that's not, or you have some rogue 
um, devices, you, you also want to be able to detect them. And again, being wireless, um, it, it's also very challenging. So that's sort of an overview of the, uh, at least for me personally, the uh, type of uh, uh, projects that I work on. They're mostly cybersecurity, but they're very collaborative uh, in nature. I have to collaborate with uh, AI and, M and machine learning uh, type of people, people who do data science. Um, I also collaborate with mechanical engineers, uh, electrical, and so on. So there's, there's, we have plenty of opportunities, I think, uh, when you look at our faculty, um, for students who are interested in research to work on a number of different uh, projects. And I don't want to monopolize the uh, conversation. Uh, I mean, I want to give uh, uh, Dr. McKinney also a chance to, to maybe talk a little bit more about uh, things he uh, um, he's working on. This is just a different domain, uh, but there I think there are some overlaps uh, in, in some of the projects. Yeah, so yeah, uh, Brett, before you get started, I'd also like to say as a bridge to that, you know, we talk about research, the, we're really good about bringing these experiences into the classroom as well and, and the expertise without question. So, um, yeah, Dr. McKinney, would you like to say some things about your your sure. areas? Yeah, so I'm Brett McKinney. Um, I am also the, the, the advisor for master students. And so um, at the end, we can maybe do have, you know, if you have questions or I can say a few things, um, at the end um, about some of the nuts and bolts, like you might want to know, like, how do I enroll? And, you know, and, and we may not have, we can also do those things offline. I'm, I'm also happy to help, like, if you have an email, just, you know, just email me questions about about that. Did you have something else, Mauricio? I just want to say I, I, I do the PhD. Um, I'm responsible for PhDs, but uh, Dr. McKinney and I, we work closely together. So, he can also answer questions about our PhD programs, and I, I'm also available uh, if anyone has questions about anything related to uh, what we do. Um, so between yeah, between the two of us, we we take care of all the all the MSs and all the uh, PhDs. And if you have any questions that are coming up during this, you can put them in the chat, and and, and you can also just ask on your microphone as well. Um, but just a little bit about. About me, I have a, I'm a professor in um, computer science, and I have a joint appointment in the math department. Um, I my background is actually in, in theoretical physics, and so I'm very interested in scientific computing um, as well as machine learning. Um, I teach a class um, at the undergraduate and the graduate level uh, on scientific computing, how you basically use computer science algorithms and numerical algorithms to solve problems in physics and engineering um, and we have some research in that area as well I still do some some mathematical physics type of projects as well well that have some computational components in them um, and so I so I teach that that and I also teach a bioinformatics class um, that talks about the algorithms that you use and gives you a lot of background about, you know, the biology of the data that you're analyzing. And basically, it's a lot of applications of machine learning algorithms for biological data. Um, and I teach a network theory class that gets into, you know, things like modularities and centralities and how you apply those in various areas um, in science and, and, and uh, cyber type of networks as well. Um, so in the in the bioinform so so I do some machine learning method development so we have some methods that we've kind of homegrown and there's a lot of opportunities for research of like modifying them and trying new things we do a lot of, of the development in our packages but we use some Python and Julia and um, sometimes we even use Fortran and C++ um, but we use a lot of different languages um, but ours is one of our probably most popular. So um, we do a lot of collaborations. There's a group in Tulsa called the Laureate Institute for Brain Research that we have a close collaboration with. We know a lot of the investigators there and they generate a lot of interesting data um, that we then can get our hands on and, and try different things, machine learning algorithms um, and try them on like things like gene expression data and neuroimage data they have a ton of like fmri data it's like basically time series or volumetric data 
um, very high dimensional, interesting data, and they're interested in things like whether someone has depression or not, or whether there are targets for therapies in the brain and those sorts of things. So we, we work with a lot of that data. And so we also do um, some mathematical modeling, like with differential equations for things like chemical kinetic data. Um, and so there's a lot of uh, interesting math um, involved as well. And we've been doing things in this this area called fractional calculus and trying to find different applications for that. Something that was kind of interesting as uh, Dr. Papa was talking that, that it has some overlap is what I would might call anomaly detection. And so we're we're doing um, some machine learning, as, as I mentioned, with NASA data to essentially detect rare, unusual things like if it's. Um, the mass spectrometer detects something that might be a biosignature. And so that might be a very rare event that is would be almost considered an anomaly or something that could also be of scientific, a scientific target of interest. And so over time, I think we're going to have more of a collaboration with NASA and in terms of a lot of like communications and autonomous decision making of a lot of these orbiters because, you know, you can't do real time communication with a human. And so how do you also develop trustworthy machine learning that can make these types of, of decisions? And um, I think that's going to be an important area of machine learning is like, in, in, in Mauricio mentioned it, like in Dr. Hale, uh, interpretable um, AI. Um, because maybe sometimes the, the algorithm that, it, you know, the, the, the um, network, the neural network that it learned to, to classify something, maybe you just can't understand it. I mean, but, um, and, and it might get to that point where we just can't understand it. We're just like, yeah, it's right most of the time. Um, but, you know, how do you get a human in the loop? How do you get a human to maybe understand something that's making such an important decision that you don't want to simply leave it to a machine? So we're very interested in like interpretable machine learning and feature selection, like what are the features in the data that are driving this decision that it's making so that we can make an, you know, a better informed uh, decision. So that's kind of a, a big picture of some of the things that I do. And then uh, um, I'm happy to also talk about some of the things about course, you know, some, some of the basic requirements of the masters and um, since I think that's a majority of, of the people that we have joining us. Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, I, I agree talking about courses and what those options are and, um, mm -hmm. you know, some of the opportunities for assistantships and whatnot, we can also visit about. Yeah, so I think at that point, maybe we could talk, open it up for questions if there are any. Um, also, um, if there are any specific questions about the application process or what to expect if you're an international student, you can just email me. Um, our admissions person, Molly Desimone, she um, was not able to join today, otherwise she would be able to answer questions right now. But if you do have questions about that, what to expect as an international student or where to go or things like that, I will put my um, email in the chat. and. Just go ahead and send me a quick email and then I will get the information back to you as soon as possible. Um, but yeah, and if you do have a question, you feel free to put in the chat for any of our professors here. Um, and then yeah. Great job. Cool. And if you get hung up in, in any of the steps of the application process, we're good at emailing you back and getting you, you know, feedback about that. So if you get stuck, just let us know. Well, while we're waiting for questions, I'm trying to think if there's anything we, you know, any particular knowledge we ought we ought to impart. I mean, you know, as, as it's been said, TU is a small school that prides itself on an intimate learning environment. Class sizes are, especially at the graduate level, uh, are very manageable. I mean, you may it's not unusual to have a class that's got six or twelve students in it. Um, some of the more popular classes may grow to be in the area, you know, fifteen to twenty. Uh, graduate students. Uh, that's a that's a big graduate class for us. Um, those of you that have applied or have expressed interest in your research, you probably know that our master's program is a 30 hour program. Um, there is a thesis and a non thesis option. A thesis 
of course, involves some research uh, uh, and the non-thesis option, and a minimum of six thesis hours, I think, is, uh, or is it, oh, it's up to six thesis hours, I'm sorry, up to six thesis hours, six is the normal. Um, the non-thesis option is 30 hours of all course credit. Um, and I would just interject, um, one of the, we usually recommend people come in doing the non-thesis because you can always switch to the thesis option. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you come, um, if you start and enroll and you identify uh, a faculty advisor mentor or, um, who wants to, you know, do a thesis with, um, you can, you can easily switch between them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you're right, it's a little more comp. It's, it's quite a bit more complicated to go in the reverse direction. Uh, you know, in terms of funding, um, uh, occasionally we'll have master students uh, that we pick up for teaching assistantships. Um, there are opportunities on occasion for research assistantships, you know, and both of those things um, provide you with a, a stip monthly stipend. Um, it varies from situation to situation, but uh, most of them also uh, support uh, tuition. Uh, uh, nine hours a semester is is typical. Did you want to say anything about teammate? Yeah, there actually there is kind of a novel program in place uh, that's accessible to grad students, mostly PhD students, is but occasionally I think we have. Uh, entertained uh, master student applications for this program that uh, provides a really robust stipend. I believe it's like three thousand dollars a month, full tuition, and up to four years of support. Um, it's for graduate students interested in, I guess, what I would call commercializable research opportunities. So uh, there's a a company they call themselves a foundry called Teammate that works with uh, with TU and is supported by a philanthropic organization to provide these assistantships. You match a student with a project and a faculty mentor. Uh, and the idea is uh, by the time they complete their research, which either would yield a thesis or a dissertation, um, they've worked with teammate and and partners to try to see what the commercialization opportunities are. And there's also an incentive in teammate uh, to um, stay in the area after you graduate and work in the area that there's a financial incentive for that as well. I think it's an extra $20,000 um, if you stay for two years in the Tulsa area. But the main benefit of it is you really get some additional oversight and work and support from these uh, uh, people in an industry that really understand the, the space. And the areas of emphasis are cybersecurity and artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, and data science. So it's a really great funding opportunity as well. So there's here's a, a question on what F120s that I'm not uh, as familiar with. I don't know if Brett or Mauricio, you might have some insight if you look in the chat. How long does it take for um, an international student to get his or her F120. I don't know if I, I certainly don't know the answer to that, but. The, the you mean the, is that, let me see the. So the, um, I'm sure you're probably familiar with the process. The um, University of Tulsa, once you're admitted, will, will give you an I-20. And then with that I-20, if you need a visa, you 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 go to the uh, to a consulate, and uh, then they will give you the um, the F1. Uh, that's a process. Uh, how long it takes? It depends on the embassy, embassy, and it it depends on the um, on the country. Some countries you can you know, very quickly, and some others it may take two to three months. So my recommendation would be. If you're interested in probably joining in the fall, and that'll be August, I think uh, you, you probably want to make sure you, you have your application in probably April or May, uh, so you can get the I-20 and have enough time to uh, uh, get the visa. In most places, be, before you can even go to the, um, to the uh, consulate, you have to get an appointment. 
uh, and they have you know automated systems to do that and so you cannot really control when um, that's going to be so i'd say the more time you have probably the better you'll be i don't think uh, we, we mentioned this but we we don't have like hard deadlines for uh, for applications we evaluate both uh, dr mckinney and myself we evaluate applications on a rolling basis so as soon as they come in um, we try and evaluate them so if, if you have a chance to apply early my recommendation would be to to go ahead and do that also dr mckinney myself you know we're available you probably have our contact information and i would say you know if you're in the process of applying um, and maybe things are uh, not moving or or you think there are delays uh, applications are typically handled by grad school uh, so if if you're in a position where you think maybe things are being delayed i would encourage you to contact dr mckinney uh, or myself if you're applying for a master's probably dr mckinney if it's a phd with myself and then we can get in touch with grad school and make sure that um they accelerate the process or if something's been delayed or maybe if you don't know why your application is not being processed um, and and a long time has gone by please get in touch uh, sometimes graduate school will not release an application to dr mckinney or myself if maybe there's a piece of information or something that's missing uh, and maybe you want to know why uh, that that happens so um, anyway, that's all I have to say. We do uh, we evaluate applications on a rolling basis, so apply as soon as you can would be my my uh, my advice, and make sure you have at least three months if you need to get an uh, an F one uh, visa. Uh, we had another question about scholarship options, and yeah, uh, you know, we could talk about a couple of things. We, I, I mentioned the assistantships, which typically encumber some work obligation. If you're on a teaching assistantship, for instance, um, you're going to be assigned to manage to help manage some courses and lab sections, and it's supposed to be 20 hours of work. Research assistantships are much the same. The 20 hours are allocated for you to work yeah. on research. But when we talk about um, scholarships, um, you, Mauricio and Brett, you may know more than I do about it, but I think in the past, recent past, the graduate school has offered some merit-based scholarships that don't encumber uh, work requirements, but I'm not sure where we are with those. That tends to change from year to year. So is there anything to say about that? Yeah, that uh, normally is done. We have a requirement uh, for people to submit GRE scores and grad school will, will give some sort of financial um, assistance ba based on that GRE score. So the better you are in the GRE scale, the uh, better your chances. I have also uh, just to add to what Dr. Hill was saying about assistantships. We, we also look sometimes at, you know, GRE scores to, to help us evaluate uh, uh, our grad students. Mo most of those assistantships are, are merit based and the GRE um, kind of gives us a level <laughs> playing field or, or, or sort of a standard to use to evaluate students who may be coming, you know, from uh, different countries, different schools different backgrounds and um, so um, I've seen grad some people with really really good GRS, GRE score sometimes graduate school may, may give maybe 25 uh, percent and like Dr. Health was saying that changes a year of, over year so I, I don't know exactly what they're doing that right now but um, a good GRE score will, will help you. Wonderful. Are there are there any other questions? Anything about the classes or the student, you know, environment, the you know, the city of Tulsa? Um, we're happy to answer any of those. 
we also only have four minutes left um, before the teams will kick us out, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but yeah, if you do, if anyone has any last minute questions, now will be the time. If not, um, you can send an email to uh, whoever you would like to have your questions asked or answered, and then uh, we'll do that. Cool. Looks like somebody's typing. Yeah, looks like. OK, all right. Hey, thank you very much. Yeah. OK, great. Well, if there are no other questions, then thank you all so much for joining um, from wherever you are. And I hope you guys have a great evening, afternoon or morning. Um, and we will be posting this recording on our LinkedIn pages, so I will be sure to send out that information as well if you are interested.